Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Wow, what an exciting week this has been for us here at Liberty University on Global Focus Week. Right off the bat, can we thank the 111 org leaders from all over the world that have come here to partner with us and let us know what God's up to around the world. Uh, it's been amazing. I walked through uh, Montview the other day and I was just watching our students engage and learn and, and begin relationships. And I really feel like what God is doing this week will have an effect, uh, you know, in the 1040 window. We'll have an effect in the corners of the world. And I think the relationships got started here that are going to just have a rippling effect in the life of people in years and years to come. So I'm so thankful for these partners today. You're going to get to hear from some of those partners. And uh, I think it's going to be life changing. Important to note that some of these partners are actually um, coming in a bit of a homecoming to see some of our students. We have 161 MKs that really are some of our foot soldiers some of our leaders on campus. I know many of you are here this morning. And uh, we typically have thousands that watch online. And so I just want to recognize our MKs and say that when uh, students walked into our very first convocation and there were 12,000 pillows in every single chair, that's because our MKs sweated that out and put them in every single chair. And when students came in yesterday and there were, you know, 10,000 shoe boxes from Samaritan's Purse, our MKs had rolled up their sleeves. And they're really the unsung heroes that put every single one of those in those chairs with a few other groups of people. And so at the end of the day, they're not just receiving the scholarship, they're giving back tenfold under uh, Nasran Morgan's leadership. So can we just put our hands together for our, our MKs? We love them. We're grateful for them. I know that the week like this is a bit of a homecoming. Uh, I, I want to introduce one group to you uh, really quickly, uh, and, uh, and then we'll get going on the morning. But before I do that, just a reminder that tomorrow will be on our um, 920 uh, September the 20th combo. Uh, this summer, the world started kind of uh, getting social media buzz around the idea of 920 being a day where people were going to storm Rockwell, right? Area 51. And so, we thought it was funny and we were all eye rolling like everybody else. But then I remembered that I had uh, kind of crossed path with a gentleman named Gary Bates, who's a bit of an authority on alien intrusion and a bit of an authority on, uh, you know, what is happening with this phenomenon that four million people are, are genuinely claiming to have had an alien intrusion in their life. And so we contacted Gary, moved our guest. For, for this date so that Gary could come because we thought since everybody's looking, why don't we give some biblical context to this conversation. And I think you're gonna really, really enjoy it. On top of that, one of the alumni, I mean, one of the uh, LU parents, uh, because his, his daughter is in the worship collective, Mac Powell from Third Day just decided, I'm gonna come see my daughter. We said, you can't just come, you gotta lead worship. So Mac Powell is gonna lead worship for us tomorrow. He's also doing some country stuff for us tomorrow. And then Gary Bates. So tomorrow's combo lock and load is gonna be a lot of fun, all right? Uh, and you know we're not doing that without some uh, alien games, all right? So it's going to be fun. Can't wait to uh, get myself in trouble and almost fired over that. All right. Uh, all right. Let me just tell you, uh, we're so thrilled and honored to have Children of the World Choir with us. Uh, and whenever they're coming around, we try to have them here. They're always a highlight for us. They're so just not just precious, but missional in their life. Every one of these children, the 15 that you're going to see lead us in worship today, because they're not entertaining, they're leading us in worship. Every single one of them uh, is really an advocate for children of the world that need sponsorship. And so they're all blessed to be sponsored already by the generosity of so many of you. However, uh, they're really pointing a finger to children just like them around the world who could very easily be taken care of in their everyday needs uh, so that we can connect them with their eternal need. And so if you'll go out to the lobby, those of you that are in this room, you can uh, grab a brochure that has sponsorship information. So if you really feel like, man, they're awesome. How do I, how do I, you know, support them, one great practical way to support them is say, man, I, I just like really want to begin a relationship. And it's not just a financial one. It's a bit of a pay, I mean, like a pen pal relationship where you get to know the child, you get to pray with the child, you get to uh, be a voice for the child, you get to uh, just be, a, again, a champion in what they're doing. 
And like I said, they're leading worship around the world, and I can't wait to be led by them. All right, so let me pray for us, and then they'll come out and start the day. Uh, I'm really thrilled about what God has for us. Father, thank you for this morning, your mercies that are always made new. Father, thank you for children of the world. Thank you for these uh, precious kiddos that just don't just come up and um, add entertainment value to where they go. It is, Father. It's enjoyable and it's fun and it's precious. But they come to just really point us to, to you. So I pray that we wouldn't just sit and watch and audit. I pray that we would just engage with them and worship with them. Give them favor. Let them feel immediately at home. We pray this in your name. Amen. Come on. Stand to your feet and put your hands together. Come on, everybody.
M blue. Thank you, children of the world from World Help. Can we thank them one more time? Weren't they awesome? Well, good morning. We are so glad that you're here. We are excited about today and when it's going to hold for us. Um, just a couple quick announcements. One is if you're still working through the passport, it doesn't take much time. Just a, one experience in visiting with some of our organizations that are here with us from around the world. Uh, you can still pick up a passport in the hub. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, if you are interested in really just learning about hospitality and how you can do hospitality well uh, through meals and drink, uh, we're going to have a special event tonight for you, and that's in South Montview Ballroom at 7 o'clock. And so you're going to be able to learn from cultural experts and practitioners who honestly just use food and drink well from all over the world. So you're going to be able to experience that, actually experience two different meals within that, uh, and that's tonight at 7. And tonight at 9, don't forget, we, uh, well, we're going to be dancing, uh, doing dancing lessons. Columbia and Salsa is going to be happening at 9 o'clock on the backside of the Freedom Tower Terrace. So please don't forget that. Um, today, the issue of human trafficking is one in which, as Pastor David was saying, we want to think biblically about and we want to think uh, rightly about. And so we've got some great help. Some speakers that are going to be giving some presentations on how they're on the front lines fighting this dark industry. And so you're going to hear from first Becky McDonald. She is the founder and president of Women at Risk International. She's in 55 countries. She's uh, consulted for uh, Quantico, for the Department of Defense, and so she's well-respected in her field, and she's gonna come give a short presentation of what they do, uh, as well as former U.S. Navy SEAL Ephraim 
Matos, who currently is on the front lines fighting this dark industry in places like Burma and even in Colombia. And so he's going to share more from his perspective as well. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and finally, uh, Mats Tunahag, who is all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. He spent the last 30 years using business to transform communities and also empower others as they begin new startups and really use their entrepreneur skills to make a difference where victims can be very, very vulnerable in some of these dark places, but where communities are very vulnerable to this industry. So we're going to hear from him and how business's mission can be the catalyst to really be the driving change. But first, let's welcome Ms. Becky McDonald uh, to the stage. Dr. Martin Luther King said, darkness does not drive out darkness, light does. And today, as the president and founder of Women at Risk International, our passion is to invade the darkness with the message of light, the light of the world. In over 55 countries and 200 some programs, including the land of the free, we create circles of protection around those who are forgotten but unforgettable. For me, this passion began early. I grew up as an American in the jungles and, and mountains of Pakistan from age five until college. And at age 14, during a war, my Muslim playmate was raped and fought back. And to teach her that she had no right to fight back, they poured acid down her throat and took her vocal cords away forever. And the acid of her suffering burned a hole in my heart and set me on a pathway of being the voice of the silenced and just wrapping arms arms of love around them and giving them a safe place to rewrite the story of their life. For La, his story began at four. His trafficked mom, a minor, brought him in the dead of night to us and asked us to protect him. She could no longer protect him. He became a straight-A student, and today he's getting an engineering degree on a war scholarship, and he's making the bracelets that you can buy online or at our booth to support his siblings for generational change. And then Chloe, her father sold her to politicians in Oklahoma City. She ran to a safe house where she began making sugar scrubs, and we stepped into her life, and that started our spa line. 90% of the girls in Southeast Asia that get picked up in a police raid and sent home without job training get resold. Rescue is just the beginning. It is not the end. Social enterprise and work with dignity for adults in our programs is core to giving them dignity and independence. Ellie was sold at two weeks old for $200, rescued at one month old. God, the father of the fatherless, heard the cry of an orphan and sent a rescue and a loving family to raise her. And that began our 911 emergency baby rescue fund. Over a decade ago, Homeland Security came into our war offices in Grand Rapids, Michigan headquarters, and I discovered that 300,000 minors in this country, American citizens with constitutional rights, are at risk every year of trafficking in this land alone, and we began rescue and aftercare. Whether I'm speaking at churches, or Quantico, or the Pentagon, or Department of Transportation, or Corrections, or hosting delegations from the State Department, I'm sounding the alarm that there is a problem in our nation and that we need to circle our cradle. Tom was asked by her family three times to sell herself in the red light district and said no. And so they just took her and dumped her and left her to be broken. And when we came into her life and took her into our safe house, she became one of our top jewelers. Today, her family, three generations, grandmother, mother, and granddaughter, all know the true and living God and all are headed in a different direction, generational change in the name above all names. I have the luxury of hindsight. When you've been at it, at risk of all manner of risks for three decades, you can look back and see generational change. What we do is not rocket science. We're not special. We're just Christ with skin on. Jump in the trenches with us. Help us leave a legacy of safe places. Every time you intern or shop, you can shop online or at the desk, each time you lift an artisan, to safety and dignity when you wrap a piece of his or her life around you. 
In the last five years, with $7 million in sales of their product, that is tens of millions of hours with wraparound services, stitches, training, um, child care, counseling. We've graduated doctors and lawyers and school teachers and goat herders and cosmetologists and cake decorators, whatever their dream. With the word of God, the people of God, and the spirit of God whispered into their lives, invading their brokenness with the light of the world. Every single degree at Liberty has a role in this fight. Every one of you can be an abolitionist. You have to be real, you have to be authentic, and you have to be vulnerable. If you're a fake, stay home. But we need your help. Training works. We have seen a brother called us on a Friday afternoon. His sister had been trafficked in the United States of America. By Saturday, she was rescued. And by Sunday, she was in a treatment program. A mother who attended our training, her daughter was trafficked. She called us. We called the FBI. She was picked up in a police raid. And today, they're united. No slave, no person who's being prostituted against their will would run into a church for sanctuary, even though it's a sanctuary. But I don't care what organized religion does or doesn't do. You believe that you are the temple of the living God. Are you a safe place to those you love? Your generation, my son's generation, are my heroes. You are born with a social justice gene in your DNA. Rise up and fight injustice. Ever since my playmate was silenced, so help me God, if it takes every last breath in my body, I will lead the fight to set the captive free and give voice to the silenced. Albert Einstein said, the world will not be destroyed by evil people, but by good people who see evil and do nothing. That's you. This is a war. War fights for peace. Women at Risk International fights for peace all over the world. What will you do with Micah 6.8? Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. This is what the Lord requires of us. You are standing at the threshold of his sanctuary. You are a possibility. <laughs> you are standing at the threshold as you step into life with your careers. What you do next is stepping into his sanctuary. That is the world. The world is sacred ground. The people out there, the men, women, and children, and we've even rescued traffickers. Nobody is beyond rescue. It's a safe place out there. It's a dangerous place out there. But when you walk with the true and living God, you have nothing to fear. You stand still and he fights for you. So my question to you today is, what will you do with Micah 6.8? How will you rise up and do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly? Testing, testing. How's it going today, Liberty? Oh, that was weak. Come on, how's it going? All right, good, good. All right, it's an honor to be here, uh, truly. Um, uh, I can't thank the LU Serve staff enough for uh, taking care of me. They got me a, a wonderful haircut yesterday, so I feel beautiful. Um, and they also got me some deodorant so I don't smell like a monkey, so I appreciate you guys. Um, so my name is Ephraim Matsos. I'm a former U.S. Navy SEAL, and uh, I run an organization called Stronghold Rescue and Relief. Um, our organization is unique in that we conduct rescue and relief operations for people suffering from genocide and human trafficking. Um, our entire model is based off of what I learned during my time in the military. Um, this wasn't always what I did though, so I want to tell you guys a little bit about my story and how I was able to take my background, my skills, and apply them to the world of human trafficking because that's what each and every one of you have to do. You have to take what you can do and apply it to help other people. So. Uh, ten years ago, when I was uh, 17 years old, I uh, signed up in the U.S. Navy and went off and uh, had the opportunity and great pleasure to serve my country uh, on the SEAL teams. And my first deployment, uh, I went to Afghanistan, and this was the first time that I saw evil up close. We were on a patrol one day, this was my second mission, my second mission ever. 
we were on a patrol and we got word that the uh, Taliban were in the area and they were, they were looking for us. And as we were patrolling along, our, our EOD technician, our explosive ordnance guy, he noticed a pink backpack sitting on the side of the road and our uh, bomb sniffing dog identified it as an IED. It was there to blow us up. So we got down to defensive positions. Our EOD guy uh, went through a, threw a bomb on it basically and we blew it in place. Well now the enemy knew exactly where we were. And one of the villagers ran up to us and said, hey, the Taliban, they're gonna come ambush you guys. They're gonna meet you guys over there in that tree line and they're gonna come get you. So uh, my platoon chief was like, no, we're gonna get them first. So we ran ahead, got into positions, ended up getting into a very, very close, very violent gunfight uh, during which one of our Afghan allies was hit. Um, as we set up a defensive perimeter to get him extracted, we, uh, we, got, we intercepted radio traffic that the Taliban was going to do another attack on our defensive positions that were going to come from the south. And I was the guy on the south with a machine gun holding security. Well, when that attack came, it wasn't a Taliban attack. It was two little girls in pink backpacks running right at me. These were suicide vests that they were going to use um, to try and blow us up. And I, as they ran at me, I knew I had no option. I had no option but to kill these two little girls, maybe eight years old. The other one was maybe six. And I screamed at them. I screamed. I was like, stop, stop, stop. And I didn't know how to say stop in, in Arabic. But I waved at them, and I screamed at them. And finally, with tears streaming down their faces, they stopped, they turned around, and they ran away. A few years later, actually 2017, I left the Navy because I wanted to do more. I wanted to be able to go to places like Burma. Um, I, I saw what was happening in Iraq with ISIS, and I, and I wanted to be part of the uh, solution. And the, the platoon that I was in wasn't being sent to Iraq, so I was like, I'm going to get out, and I'm going to go volunteer in Iraq as a civilian and do humanitarian work, do the, just do the best that I can. And so when I got to Iraq, I just so happened to be there as a civilian at the time that um, ISIS was being cleared from West Mosul. And at the time, this was the most deadly urban combat the world had seen since World War II. And ISIS was slaughtering people in the streets. They were using women and children as human shields constantly. We saw it. Um, they were uh, shooting children who were trying to run away and trying to get to us to safety. And I kept on thinking, like, I want to stop this. How can I stop this from happening um, in the first place? Yes, we want to rescue these kids. Yes, we want to help them. But I would much rather that they just didn't get hurt in the first place. This photo you're looking at was taken on the morning of May 4th, the um, final invasion and assault into West Mosul. These are thousands of civilians running away and children, women, just being slaughtered in the streets. That day, um, our interpreter was shot and he died several days later. So on June 2nd, exactly 30 days um, after this invasion, um, ISIS committed a massive uh, act of genocide, and they slaughtered over 160 people in the street. That doesn't include uh, the other probably 200 or so people who were wounded but didn't die. And on that morning, we saw a little girl in a pile of bodies and, in ISIS territory, and we knew we had to do something to go get her. So a few of us, we got together, all of us volunteers, all of us civilians, and the Iraqi army, they gave us one tank because they didn't want to go out there. Uh, we called the U.S. military, and they were, um, they were gracious enough to give us a, a smoke screen. So uh, we ran out, and we ended up uh, rescuing this little girl. And you can roll the, uh, the video. U.S. military was giving us as we moved back. We had this little girl, and uh, ISIS continued firing at us from those rubble, from those uh, from those rubble buildings. And uh, right here, um, I ended up getting hit, going down, um, but I didn't have the option to stay down. I had to get up and keep moving. You can see the little girl there, uh, who our team leader is holding and uh, carrying out. We also were able to rescue um, one man who's being dragged there. He was uh, wounded multiple times, 
And they'd been sitting in that pile of bodies for almost two days at this point. So the team was um, left basically behind the tank and we couldn't move across this street. I was already wounded, so I volunteered to, uh, to run across because if I got hit, you know, whatever, I'm already down. Um, so I ran across and sent out a Humvee to, um, to help rescue the rest of the team. And you can hear ISIS trying to, trying to take me out, but they missed. So it's all good. Um, so I, I, I had these experiences, and I thought, OK, I'm a civilian now. Even during this, I was a civilian. I thought, what can I do? Like, I want, I want to be able to do this, but I want to prevent these things from happening. I don't, I, I, I don't want to constantly have to go in and rescue people who are shot up. I'd much rather stop them from getting shot up. Um, and then the world of human trafficking, I was like, I would much rather keep women from being trafficked or keep children from being trafficked. And so as I was um, healing up from my wound, I, I was contacted by a group of people. I was, in, I was in Thailand at the time. And some of the guys I was with in Iraq, they called me and they said, hey, man, there's a group of people in Myanmar and Burma and um, their tribe is being attacked and we can't help them. Maybe you can use your skills and help them. So I met with these people, and sure enough, they told me about what was going on there in Myanmar. For the last 70 years, the civil war there has displaced hundreds and thousands and millions of people, and women are constantly being raped, villages are being burned, and lives are being destroyed. People are living in the jungle without food, without shelter. Um, kids are dying of very simple, treatable diseases, all because of the, of the um, violence of the central government, which is attacking the people. And it's all racial, right? They believe that, this, um, that these ethnics are inferior to them, so they want to eradicate them and take their land and take their resources. So I met with these guys, and we said, okay, well, what can we do to, to stop this. And they said, well, hey, there's another attack coming very soon in a few months. We know, we know the enemy is going to attack us. We want to prepare right now. And I thought, okay, well, here's my opportunity. Here's my opportunity to prevent this evil from happening. And so I went in and I embedded with these guys. And what was supposed to be three weeks turned into uh, three months that I was in the jungle by myself uh, with these guys. And our, our solution that we came up with was instead of just bringing in uh, instead of just bringing in food and supplies, let's try and stop these. Let's try and stop these bad guys. So, we ended up coming up with this solution: a group of volunteer ex-military um, guys who live there in the jungle. They volunteered and said, "Hey, we'll we'll do something. We'll stop them." And so, we got together. And we trained. I showed them how to use small unit tactics, how to best position themselves. Um, how to respond, what to do, and they got together and we created this unit, this rescue team that would go in and defend the civilians, and as soon as they were attacked, these guys, their mission would be to go in and stop, stop the genocide, stop the terrible things from happening. Well, earlier this year, we got the chance to put this theory into practice. I believe it was February of this year, um, 100 soldiers from a, from a unit were moving toward a, a village in Burma, and they started to mortar, they, just start, they started to drop mortars on the village, and the people started to run away. And immediately they called, they called our team on a satellite communication system that we had installed. These guys immediately went to the, the problem, and um, suffice it to say, they took care of things, and uh, not only did they stop the bad guys, not only did they defend every single person in that village, most of these people in, the, in these villages were able to return home because the enemy never reached their villages to burn them. No one was raped. No one was murdered. And not only did these guys stop the bad guys, they pushed them back farther than where they had started from when they made their maneuver toward these villages. And so I thought, okay, well, perfect. Here we go. Now we have a way to prevent these things. And as I, as I, as I looked at the numbers and I, as I looked at what, what it is that we had just done and what, what, what these guys had just accomplished, I realized it's so much more cost effective, it's so much more efficient to solve the problem before it starts. And there's so many different ways to do that. You're gonna hear uh, in a little bit from um, someone who uses business 
to, to combat human trafficking, to, to stop these things before they happen. So I wanna share with you guys, I only have a couple minutes left, so I wanna share with you guys a few of the lessons that I've learned during my time uh, doing frontline humanitarian work. And these basic principles and concepts, you can apply them to whatever your ministry is, whatever it is that you uh, are gonna do to, to help make the world a better place and, and, and help people. Um, the first is that there are many facets to human trafficking. Um, as she said earlier, rescue is just the beginning. And I would go so far as to say prevention is the beginning, and then there's rescue. And then there's aftercare. There are so many people who have been um, brutalized and have had, had horrible, terrible um, things happen to them, and they need your help. If you're a psych major, there's people who you can help. If you're a nursing major, there's people who you can help. If you're into politics, you can prevent these things from happening with good policy. So we each have our role to play, and mine, mine is unique. Um, I'm, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't do the politics thing. Um, I, I'm not, I can't do the nursing thing. I don't have a clue about psychology. But I have a skill set that I can use, and we have to work together as teams. We have to work together with other organizations to have a holistic approach and to truly combat this thing. The second thing is charity with dignity. Um, all of our operations and everything that we do, we enable the locals. So my rule um, in, my, in my organization is I never send in more than four people, never more than four people. And the reason for that is, well, there's, there's a lot of reasons for it, but it's, it's cost effective, of course, but I want to train the locals to be able to do these things. I don't want to show up and say, hey, here I am, I'm from the West, I've got, I've got, I've got everything figured out, here's, here's what you need to do. That doesn't work. Charity with dignity. You go in, you meet with the leaders and you find out what they need. They'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you what their problems are. If you show up and tell them, this is what you have to do, a lot of times you're only making the problem worse. Furthermore, charity with dignity and enabling them to take care of themselves helps to rebuild these communities. They see someone who looks like them, speaks their same language. Maybe it's their father, maybe it's their brother, maybe it's their sister who is able to help and make their community a better place. And then that also, um, allows, if, if, if at some point all the funding dries up and I can never go back to these places, you want to know what? They still have the skills. They still have the stories. They still have the capability there to continue the work long after we're gone. The third thing is people, people often ask me, uh, you guys saw the video of the, of the tank, people always ask me, like, how did, you know, how did you have the courage to go and do that? How did you, why, why would you go do that? Why would you go spend months rotting in the, in the Burmese jungle um, to help these people. You're not making any money. You know, you could be doing all kinds of other things with my background. And I always tell them, especially when they ask about the video, I say, what if that was your daughter? What if that was your sister? What if that was your mom? What if that was your brother? What if that was somebody that you knew? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a choice. You would go and you would help in any way that you possibly could. And um, as the pastor said last night, he was talking about honor. He was talking about honoring um, other people. If you truly believe that we're all made in God's image, then you can't help but do something. If you truly believe that we're all brothers and sisters, then it's a, then it's a no contest. You're going to go help. You're going to do something. And the fourth thing is people say, well, I, you know, I can't go live in the jungle. I, can't, you know, I wasn't a SEAL or I, I don't know how to start a business. I don't know how to do any of these things. And that's fine. I'm going to leave you with this quote by the English statesman Edmund Burke. And it's, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, men and women, to do nothing. So whatever it is that you can do, just do something, even if it's just a little bit, because there are people out there who need you and they're waiting for you. So do what you can. Thank you. Well, well done. Good morning. Please stand up. And please sit down. We're creating a movement fighting human trafficking. We're going to talk about human trafficking. That is black, that is dark, like my dress code. But there's a silver lining, there is hope, there is freedom through business. Silver lining, like my gray hair. So the outline is right here. <laughs> There's darkness, 
there is hope. Liberty, freedom, talking about freedom at liberty. Freedom is linked to dignity, to human dignity, and human dignity is rooted in God. And we are created in his image, thus we have dignity, and with that dignity comes freedom. Freedom to work, to express ourselves, freedom to move, freedom of religion, freedom to engage in different spheres of society. I only ask to be free. The butterflies are free. Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist. Just living is not enough. One must have sunshine, freedom, and a little flower. Hans Christian Andersen, it's Danish, little mermaid, if you know that one. All the great things are simple, and many can be expressed in a single word, freedom, justice, and hope. Winston Churchill. And the truth will set you free. Jesus. Freedom and dignity belongs together. And freedom is multifaceted, and God wants us to not only have freedom, and the freedom is not to do what we want, but to do what we ought to do. The opposite of freedom and dignity is dehumanizing bondage, slavery, human trafficking. William Wilberforce, 200 years ago, realized that the slavery and the slave trade going on was a dehumanizing bondage, contrary to God's will, contrary to dignity and freedom. Have you seen the movie Amazing Grace? There is a scene where they're having dinner, they come in with some chains and stuff and put on the dinner table, and then they tell a story about the slaves in Jamaica at the sugar plantations, and that wakes William Wilberforce up. We need to fight this. But how? He could have gone the easy route. Let's boycott sugar from Jamaica. No more sugar in our tea, high tea in London. But no, he looked at what is the systemic issue? What is the root cause? Not the feel-good factor for me to get involved, but actually free the slaves. Well, in the British Empire, slavery and slave trade was legal, so he decided we need to fight the legal battle. And it was not a quick fix. It took 30 years, and he was fighting against the backbone of the British Empire and their economy. So it was not a popular thing. 30 years, tenacity, and eventually slavery and slave trade got banned. And it rolled on uh, throughout the world. 1865, an important year in the history of the U.S. Slavery was banned only in the 1960s in Saudi Arabia and in the 1980s in Mauritania in West Africa. But the issue today is not a legal battle. We still have slavery. Today we call it human trafficking. People are tricked, trapped, and enslaved. And basically, every country on this planet is involved, either as a country of origin, transit, or destination. 40, maybe 50 million people are held as slaves today. And that is more people than were shipped across the Atlantic during the legal slave trade. 
So we need to ask ourselves today, so how do we stop human trafficking? How do we stop modern day slavery? Have you seen the movie Taken? I'm sorry, forget it. If you haven't seen it, don't watch it. The plot is basically there's an American girl being kidnapped into trafficking and her father then goes on a global killing spree to rescue her daughter. I understand his ambition. The two problems with it, one, it clouds the issue. I mean, there is a hypothetical risk that a plane will crash on top of your house. Not very likely. Very few people are being kidnapped into human trafficking. It, it, these are exceptions. We're going to look at the root cause in a minute. The second problem with it is that he goes about, the father, on an extrajudicial killing spree. And if you're a law student, you think, wow, that's not good. That's not rule of law. Human trafficking is a grave injustice. Absolutely. God hates that. God is just. He loves justice. We need to fight human trafficking, which is injustice. But we mustn't fight injustice with perverted justice. We mustn't fight injustice with a perverted justice. It's about freedom and dignity, both as a goal and as means. Does that make sense? Good. So, what is a root cause today? We want to be like William Wilberforce, ask ourselves not just, hey, what can we do to feel good about it? The easiest thing you can do today is to be against human trafficking. Who is not against human trafficking? Rather, if we want to stop it, prevent it, and restore the survivors of it, we need to look at what is the systemic issue? What is the root cause? Short video clip will indicate this. This story is true. 
the numbers are a little bit old in terms of, but it is the second biggest organized crime in the world. And it's highly profitable. It's more profitable than drug trafficking. Because drugs you can only sell once, people you can sell again and again. And it is an evil trade, and a root cause is unemployment. About 15 years ago, I was uh, organizing a global consultation focusing on a country in the Middle East. Can't tell you details for security reasons, but Christians are being killed and persecuted. And I got all the key Christian leaders together, and we've been running that consultation ever since. Um, and so it was quite intense. We were in the Middle East, outside a big city, two hours outside of the city, so it was just a highway. There was nothing really around that hotel building. And after two days leading this consultation, I was feeling, I need to get out, I need to go for a walk. So I'm Swedish, don't hold that against me. So I walked out the hotel building and, real, and said, I'm gonna go that way and I'm gonna walk for 30 minutes, turn around and walk back. And after 30 minutes, I was warm, sweaty, and across the street, they said cafe, bar, restaurant. I thought, well, I'm just gonna go in there and, and have something to drink, and then I'll walk back. So I come into this little cafe, bar, restaurant thing, um, maybe at the quarter of the size of, of the stage, maybe a third of the size of that. And this was the middle of the night, along a highway, and lo and behold, I'm not alone. There are about 15 cafe tables, and at each of the cafe tables, there are two beautiful young girls, Slavic looking, lightly dressed. And I'm thinking the journalist in me wakes up, what's wrong with this picture? So I decided I'm gonna sit down, go have a booth, I'm gonna find out what's going on here. So the waiter came, I ordered my drink, and then he came back and said, do you wanna talk to one of the girls? And I said, sure. And to make a long story short, who were all these girls in the middle of nowhere, along a highway, doing here? Well, the story was that these 30 girls or so, upper teens, early 20s, all came from Central Asia, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, no jobs at home. They've been offered a job in Europe handed over the passport, and now they were being shipped to a brothel in the Middle East. This is an evil trade. But the root cause, you can read as many reports as you like, and the U.S. State Department puts out a report every summer called uh, the TIP report, because the technical term for human trafficking is trafficking in persons. It's very good, it goes through every country in the world, and now it even includes the U.S. It didn't do that in the beginning. And you can see how they identify unemployment as one of the, the, the root causes. So if unemployment is a root cause, we need to, because that makes people vulnerable to human traffickers and creates high risk areas. So then, if that is the cause, what is the cure? Jobs. Jobs with Dignity. Who creates jobs? Business people do. And within the business as mission movement, we recognize that God calls, equips, and deploys people to serve Him and serve people in and through business. So we need a lot of business people and professionals in business if we're gonna fight human trafficking. There are two sides to it. One is prevention. As Ephraim said, you know, it's better if we can stop it in the first place. Where there are high risk areas, high unemployment, there is usually where people are being tricked and trapped. So if we can create labor-intensive businesses in those areas, we are preventing human trafficking. But then we need to be able to answer the following question. 
out of trafficking into what? If we can't answer that question, we haven't accomplished much. Out of trafficking into what? There needs to be a job with dignity at the other end. And statistics shows that about 80%, age zero percent, that are being rescued or helped out of a trafficking situation that don't find a job with dignity at the other end is re-trafficked. So when we talk about prevention, we're talking about restoration of the survivors of human trafficking, we're talking about jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. So if you want to deal with this systemic issue, have a solution with dignity, because handouts never give dignity, jobs do. We need to recognize that who holds some of the most strategic keys to fight human trafficking? Yes, it is business people. So there is an increasing number of businesses that are saying that's what we want to focus on. We call them freedom businesses. A business that exists to fight human trafficking. Now, let's say there are 40 million people held as slaves today. It could be 50 or 60. What does that mean? We need to create 40, 50 million jobs. If you like a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG, that's the one. And that's just in the restoration phase. To stop it, we need business people to create jobs with dignity. So 2011, we initiated in the BAM Global Think Tank, BAM standing for Business as Mission, an international working group looking at the whole issue of business solutions to human trafficking. My wife led that group. She is the real expert on, on human trafficking. And the suggestion from that group was, we need to scale. We can't just have a few freedom businesses, sort of micro, small, size businesses. We need to scale to medium and large, and we need to link these businesses with one another and to the market and to product development and all kinds of things. So we decided to create the Freedom Business Alliance, which is a global trade association that exists to help freedom businesses succeed. Here's a short intro, a video, to the Freedom Business Alliance. At its core, human trafficking is an economic problem. Businesses powered by greed, where people are the product, where life and dignity is traded for cold profit. An economic problem needs an economic solution. Without the means for sustainable employment, 80% of rescued victims are sucked back into the cycle of destruction which is why business is coming to the forefront in the fight against human trafficking. Employment can offer a preventative solution as well as provide hope and dignity for survivors. We call them freedom businesses, and they're our heroes. But in order to succeed, many of these businesses need strong partnerships, which is why we created the Freedom Business Alliance. The FBA is made up of men and women just like you, a network of people around the world that are using their skill and expertise to change the tide of this battle. We're committed to serving freedom business owners by providing mentoring, training, and resources. We're stronger together, and we believe it's time for business to profit for people rather than from them. Join the Alliance. As we draw to a close for this presentation, um, let me mention a few ways how you can engage. None of us is going to take on 40 million by him or herself. All right? So join the Freedom Business Alliance, and lo and behold, the website is freedombusinessalliance.com, not rocket science. Uh, then next year, 
In Thailand, Thai food is excellent. Anybody here likes Thai food? Oh, there you go. See, the real Thai food is in Thailand, not here. So please come to Thailand to the Freedom Business Forum. That's where you can connect with all the key leaders in the global ecosystem of the Freedom Business Movement. That's the ultimate one-stop shop. If you want to connect with the global freedom business movement, there are two ways of doing it. Take a year off, have a lot of money, travel around the world and try to connect with them. Or come to Thailand next year because everybody else will be there. Take your pick. There you go. Three more. As you study, commit to excellence and professionalism. Because the freedom business movement and freedom businesses, we need the best. We're fighting an evil, we're fighting a BHAG, and we need you. We need the best. Then look around you, here in Virginia and beyond. Learn from people and businesses that are employing vulnerable people, because we're dealing with uh, especially people who are coming out of trafficking, people who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. And there are special challenges as you try to employ these people. But we need to work with many people because there is a bridge to freedom, there is not a jump to freedom, and businesses is a, a part of that bridge. But uh, going from sort of getting people out of a trafficking situation into a job, there are a number of steps in between. So maybe there is an NGO, a non-government organization or non-profit in your community that uh, you can work with. Lastly, an example of a freedom business. Come with me to the Himalayas, to Nepal. Poor village. All the girls, four, five, six, eight years old, were sold into prostitution to brothels in India. Poverty, unemployment was the cause, and cultural issues. A freedom business came into the area and looked at how can we create jobs here, and they did. They started a tourism adventure business. So people come in and they do homestays, they stay with the villagers, they work in the village, and they, they pay for that. The village started to be transformed, changed, jobs with dignity was created, and it led to freedom. Today, not a single girl is uh, trafficked from that village. You can say hallelujah if you want to, but you can also just... <laughs> you can also applaud, right. Um, let me see. I'm trying to get something up there, but... All right. There... Um... We skip that one. If you want to look at more uh, resources, look at businessesmission.com and matstunahag.com. There is more stuff on... Um, on this, and there should be possibly a handout for you as well that has those links. Lastly, fighting human trafficking is not instant coffee. There's no quick fix here. There's no jump to freedom. It's a long journey. There's no easy road to freedom. But we need you. Join the movement. Let freedom ring. Can we thank all of our speakers today who just did a fantastic job just helping us think through the issue? 
today on your way out, if you'd like to read more about Ephraim's story, he'll be out there if you want to talk more with him. But he's also got his book right here, City of Death, and it's only $5 today. And so there's a limited supply, but they're out there. Uh, we encourage you to buy one of those. And if you want to learn more about what Becky's doing, it's warinternational.org. Other than that, we will see you tonight at Salsa Dancing Lessons. Bye-bye.